All right, we are continuing our series on Christmas called It's All Good News. Now, when you Google why I left the church, when you put that in Google, why I left the church, you get 877 million hits, pages in 0.45 seconds. It comes up that fast. Now, I trolled through the first million or so, and, um, and just to find out what the common thing is. And the common story seems to be, when people leave church, the common phrase is, it's so good to not have to hate anymore. Wow. I kept reading that it was so freeing. See, what these blogs, what these books that are highlighted in this seem to say is that being a Christian means that you're supposed to not like not accept, not be around certain people. So I got on the phone and I called a few of our daughters. So I called three of our daughters and I, I told them about what I read and what I saw. And I said, do you see that with your friends that have no longer come to church? What do you see? And they said that their friends that used to go to church, they said, actually, this is kind of true. They said they don't go anymore and they don't go anymore because they said going to church was kind of like going to a cult. Only certain people belong. And if only certain people belong, they have to believe a certain thing and they have to act a certain way. Otherwise, get out and don't come back. And that's why their friends have given up on church. So what is this about? What is that about? 877 different pages that you can look, look to. Somehow, a version of faith where you have to dislike a group of people and kind of keep your walls up around them. Somehow, a version of faith where you have to basically hate a certain kind of group, either inside or outside the church, a version of faith that makes you have to constantly look for a way out, a look for a way to get away from these people, to can't wait to get out of this thing and kind of shake yourself free of all that, that pressure and tension and, and, and just move on. I mean, somehow, none of those versions are good news, right? None of it's good news. That's all bad news. All bad news. Now, as we've said throughout the series, for most people, the first thing that people question when it comes to Christianity is not, is it true? They question, is it good? Is it really that good? I mean, because if it causes me to hate, I don't care how true it is. If it makes me a bad person, I'm not going to be a part of this. If it means that I can't live my life fully and, and be myself around certain people, then clearly this is not good news. Now, when we hear news, news that is not good, we hope it's not true, right? We hope this isn't true that we can see on Google. Whether it's a medical diagnosis or, or something about your job, when the news is not good, you hope it's not true. But when you hear news that's good, good news, you hope it's true no matter what. No matter what it is, if it has to do with your health or your finances or your job or the person you're dating or your marriage, when you hear good news, you immediately hope this is true. So the question that we are wrestling with over these last few weeks is if the message of Jesus is good, then why don't people join in? Why aren't people joining in and hoping it's true? And why is it that there are so many different variations of faith that are ungood that people are looking for ways to get out? Because when Jesus' birth was announced, remember what was said? When his announcement happened, the initial announcement, the headline, that we're interrupting your normal broadcast for this breaking news, it was called good news. That was the terminology. Let's call it what it is. The phrase is good news of great joy for everyone. It lit up everyone. And that was the shocking part. It wasn't just for you. It wasn't just for your family. Not just for your city. Not just for people that are like you. It was good news for everybody. People couldn't imagine it. For everyone. Because when you hear good news, you want it to be true. Because if it's good, then why are we resisting it? Why do we see our world resisting it? Why are people looking for a way out? Why are people hoping that, you know, I wish it could be better? So what happened? What happened to the good news? Why isn't everybody joining in? Why doesn't everybody want it to be true? Today we're gonna to look at the idea that maybe what happened is we happened. Maybe we happened. Maybe it's a little bit of our fault. 
Because the church has definitely sanitized the good news. The church has definitely politicized the good news. We've prospertized the good news. We've anti-intellectualized the good news. We've personalized and internalized the good truth and reduced it to something that you just have to believe. Just believe enough just to get into heaven. Rather than what are we supposed to do and how are we supposed to live all the time? But when you read the gospel, the good news, when you read the accounts of the life of Jesus, it's not actually primarily about what happens after you die. And it's not primarily about what you believe. It's about how you live. About how we live our life. It's about how we treat other people. And when it gets reduced down to what's in it for me, in spite of how that might affect you, that's not good news. It's not. That's not great joy for all nations. That's not great joy for all people. That's not the original news. That's a pick and mix news, right? That's going to pack and save and just kind of picking what you like. You pick and choose the parts that suit you. you. You pick and choose the parts that suit me and my family. I'll pick it and I'll choose the parts that'll benefit me or I'll go somewhere else where I can choose something better for me and my family. But the moment we do that, the moment I do that, it's no longer good news of great joy for all nations and all people. Now it's just good news for some. Let me give you an extreme example. When I was a youth pastor, when I first came to New Zealand, church started to grow, started to attract different people from around the city and things. And I was actually asked by the leadership of the church to go approach certain people in our church, certain people that were hard to love, certain people that were loud, were messy, kind of awkward people, and ask them to try and look for a different church. I was asked this. Because the leadership thought they were keeping the people that they wanted to grow the church with, keeping them away. So, being a good American, I didn't do what I was told. <laughs> and now, years later, honest to goodness, I still get phone calls from those awkward people thanking me and thanking the church for that time when they knew they were awkward and they knew they were messy because they now know they would not be followers of Jesus. They would not be married today. Some of them said, we, I would not be alive today without that messy season with a group of people in a church that loved me and walked with me. That's good news, right? That's good news. See, the point is this. If my version of the good news and if your version of the good news is not good for everyone, if it's not good for the righteous and the unrighteous saints and sinners, if it's not good for your crazy sister-in-law and your nutty uncle, if it's not good for your skeptical cousin, if it's not good for that one person in your family that you know is coming for Christmas and you're really worried they're going to stay a lot longer than they said they're going to stay, <laughs> if it's not good for that annoying neighbor or that awful boss or that hard-to-work-with colleague, If it's not good news for them, it's not the original news. And we're following the wrong thing. So the question today is, am I good news? Am I good news? As a Jesus follower, your good news of great joy for all people. Or are you just good news for people like you? Or are you just good news for people that you like? Or even worse, are you just good news to yourself? And you'll just do and say what you like, whether it helps to greater gospel purpose or not. Because I think, actually I know, we're all smart enough to know if this is the case, that if we get this right, our families, our church, our city, our neighborhoods would be different. They would all be gooder. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, do you remember what he said about what characterizes you as one of his followers? He says this, by this all men and women, everyone in the world will know that you're following me by the way you treat, by the way you love one another. 
that the way you treat and the way you love other people, that's good news. That's where the good news becomes tangible at that point. Every single generation, every generation of Jesus followers is responsible to ensure that the next generation continues living out the original good news. We pass on the faithful people who pass on the faithful people who pass it on to faithful people. Jesus could not have been clear about this. He could not have been clear. How do we miss this? How do we miss this? How can we miss the fact that Jesus says that when he's preaching, he says to people who are gathered to follow him, he says to you, and when he says you, he means all of you. You, 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 me, all of us. He says, you let me tell you, let me tell you who you are. If you're going to follow me, if you're a lot of the world, not just Judea, not just Samaria, not just, you know, Galilee, but the whole world, you are the light of the whole world. Matthew 14 and 16, light of the whole world. He says, I want everyone who chooses to follow me to understand you are the light of the whole world to everyone. This message is for the whole world. And when you understand it properly, we're going to be seen as light. As in the lights will come on. As in all of a sudden I see myself in a whole different way. And all of a sudden I see you all in a whole different way. I, I see my responsibilities differently. I see my life differently. I see everything differently now. The light bulb has come on. You're the light of the world. So let your light shine before others that they may see your good news. Sorry, your good deeds that come from good news. Now, when it talks about good deeds going to good news, this is not about a project. This is not about having a project that you can do to help that person because they need help, so I'm going to do this. That's not what this is about. This is not about you fixing somebody else. This is about how we treat others, how we love others. Because your light may be the only light that other sees at that moment. Your light may be the only thing that magnifies, the scripture says glorifies, which means magnifies who God really is. It's not about being nice for the sake of being nice. It's about loving everyone else in such a way that people see God. They see Jesus by the way we treat them. In other words, my responsibility, your responsibility is to personify the good news. Personify. That's what this is about. Personifying the good news. Consider Apostle Paul. Initially, when he heard about the good news, he did not think it was good, right? When Paul first heard about it, he did not understand this good news. He got a version of the news because he was a Pharisee. And his future and his finances and his popularity, everything about him was tied up to the old ways. All right? here's the thing. People who benefit the most from the old view benefit from the ways things were always done, who get the most status at the way things have always been done around here, they're the least inclined to move forward. They're the least inclined to let go. This is Apostle Paul. So Apostle Paul says everything about him is bound up in this old pharisaical way. So he goes off and gets himself deputized, right? And he's a violent man. He's an angry man. And he's an activist. He's a violent activist. And he decides to single-handedly, I'm going to take out all of these Christians. I'm going to take them all out. This is wrong. I'm going to fix the world. And then he runs headlong into the tsunami of the grace and love and mercy of a God he never really knew. And when that happens, he understands. He changes. It changes how he sees everything. He understands what the real news is. And he lays down all his violent ways, all his coercive ways, all his fear-mongering ways. But he continues to be an activist because that's how he's been wired. That's how God has wired him, how he's made him. But now he uses that activism not for his own purpose, but for God's. And he continues to be an apostle. He continues to be driven. He continues to be a missionary. But now he's got a different message. And he says in one of his letters, he says that the only thing that really matters, the only thing that really matters is faith working its way out in love. What? Wait, wait, wait. Aren't you the guy that arrested all those? Aren't you the guy that tortured all? You're talking about love? All you do is torture and hate. Wait, what, what? And he says, look, I didn't understand the good news before. I didn't understand how good it was. I didn't understand it was for all nations and all people of all generations, even the Gentiles. And he gave his life to clarifying for Gentile people how good the good news really was. And he became a better man. 
and Jesus became Lord. Now, when we read this, we're going to read a portion of the Bible from Philippians today. We're going to look at Philippians 2. But when we do this, let's not read this like a Bible and this is a Bible study class. Let's read this as a letter written to people that Paul really cares about. This is how he writes this. Now, when, you, when we read this letter, I want you to be thinking about what would happen? What if what we're about to read characterize every single one of us here at Central? Just start dreaming a little bit. What happens? What might happen? What happens if this characterized every single father here, every single mother here, every single high school student, every single uni student, every single business person, teacher, every single retiree? What happens if this characterized all of us? What if this is how we all lived all the time? Think about what might happen as we look at this letter. So this is what he writes. First century Christians of Philippi, he writes to us and he says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, now that you're in Christ, he says, now that you've got this brand new covenant before you, this whole new world has entered into your life. Salvation has exploded in your life because of Jesus. You've entered into this new kingdom that's forever. If you get any encouraging from that, anything encouraging about that, he goes, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing among all you people who live together in these little churches all through Philippi and all that area, in the spirit have any tenderness and compassion. In other words, he's saying if there's anything Thing about following Jesus that's come your way that you realize this is good. This is good. If you've benefited at all from Jesus and his good news, then he says, do me a favor. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and in one mind. He says, when people look at your little church and your little community, he said, I want people to see something so unique about how you treat others that they can't help but think, this is good. I want to figure this stuff out. I don't know if I believe what they believe, but I want a little piece of this because this is different from the rest of the world. See, this isn't just about something you believe about God, about his kingdom, about Jesus and resurrection. This is about something you do. This is about how we live so then Paul gets really specific. He says, how do you live lives that are so good that the people, that the, that people think the gospel is that good? And he goes, okay, number one, he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't you like to work for someone like that? Wouldn't you like to hire someone like that? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, he says, in humility, value others above yourself. And you don't value them um, above yourself because they're more valuable. You don't value them over yourself because you think you're not valuable. You treat them regardless as if they are more valuable. Why? Why would we do that? So Paul kind of goes, I'm glad you asked. He goes, because God so loved the world, because God so valued. He so valued, he put us ahead of himself, so far ahead of himself that he sent his son to die for our sins, not because we're more valuable than God, but he treats us as if we're more valuable than God. Now he says, this is what good news is about. This is the good message. I want you to live your lives in such a way that you do for others what God and Jesus has done for you. That's good news. That's really good news. That is so good that when people see that, they go, I want a piece of this. That is good news. And then he goes on. We want, he's Paul saying, I want people to look at you in your little church community and think, look, I don't really know if I buy into everything they believe and all that stuff they sing about, but I tell you what. My boss goes to that church. My friends go to that church. My teacher goes to that church. And man, the way they treat me and the way they behave, there might be something true about this. And the gospel invades. He goes on to say, not looking to your own interest, but each of you look to the interests of others. Why would you do that? That is a lousy business plan. How do you get ahead with that kind of a plan? Because that's what Jesus did for us. The essence of the gospel is that God puts you first, not because you should come first, not because I should come first. He chose to put us first. And he says, now follow me and do like I do. 
This is how I want you to treat people, all people. People who you think deserve it, and more importantly, people who you think don't deserve it. This is how I want you to treat them. It's what Jesus' followers do. It's not what they believe. It's how they live. And then this statement, I mean, I, I don't know how we missed this. I don't know why. It's not like it's written in the footnotes of your Bible. It's like one of the big verses in your Bible. He says this, and this is crazy powerful. Where do we do this? He says, in your relationships with one another. Whoa. Which relationships? All of them. Your relationship with your husband, your relationship with your wife, your relationship with your fiance, your relationship with your boyfriend, with your girlfriend, with the guy at work, with the woman you work with, the person you love, the person you don't like when they're walking towards you and you wish you can cross the street, but oh, they saw me already. All your relationships. The friendships you had with that person when we used to be on the same ministry team, but then they stopped being in that ministry team and I haven't really talked to them since. Those relationships. And then he gets real serious. Get ready for this. He says, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Why? Because it's good news. Because when we have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, in all of our relationships, what you do is you defer to them. You do what's best for them. You put them first. You place yourself under their burden instead of requiring them to place and carry your burden on your behalf. You don't power up. You step down. You pursue them to show love. You pursue them and go visit them because you haven't seen them in a while. You pursue them and have them over for a barbecue. And yeah, this is not how the world works. The world works is I keep in contact with the people that help me. The kingdom works, I keep in contact. That's it, full stop, that's good news. See, it represents a value system of the kingdom of God that was introduced when this little baby was born and proclaimed king and the earth shook and all the other kings like Herod freaked out. See, here's what Paul's talking about when he talks about Jesus. He said, who being in the very nature God did not cons who being the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage what See, God showed up among mere, mere, mere mortals and he never powered up. He never played the God card, right? He never used his power and his influence for his own benefit. You know what he did instead? Instead, now listen to this. This is what he didn't say. And this would change everything. This would change what happens in your office at work. This would change what happens in your neighborhood. This would change what happens to our country, to our church. This would change the world. In fact, it did change the world. He leveraged his power and his influence for the benefit of those with less power and less influence. See, if world leaders want to embrace this one single concept that's at the center of the gospel message, the whole world would be a better place. No one would be hungry. Nobody would be homeless. No one would be sick and without medical care. Is the message of Jesus good? Are you kidding me? It's changed the world good. That God came to earth and leveraged his power and his influence for the sake of those who had no power and had no influence. There is nothing better than this. Let's keep reading the leader, letter. It gets better as we read the letter. And then Paul writes, rather, rather than powering up and doing the God thing, he chose to make himself nothing. He chose to make himself a first century nobody. To what extent? How far did he take that? And it's unprecedented, right? This is why he changed the world. This is why the world sat up and paid attention to this amazing story of this nobody who comes from Nazareth by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and then Paul writes, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He chose to place himself under, uh, place himself under. He humbled himself to becoming obedient. Obedient to what? Obedient to death, even death on a cross. We don't have a clue what that was like. We don't have a clue of how horrifying that was. It decimated people, it made them be oblivion. People who got crucified never got talked about again. The opposite happened with Jesus. 
This is the end our Savior chose to make sure he underlined, highlighted, circled his point. I have come to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many, for everyone who chooses. I've come to leverage my power and my influence to influence those who have virtually no power, no influence, no friends, are sitting there by themselves wondering, will anybody love me? And now he says, church, do the same. You've been made in God's image. You're becoming Christ-like every day. Do the same. I want you to follow me, he says. I want you to learn from me. I want you to figure out how you in your own world, with your own family, with your own resources and your own opportunities, how can you mimic that? How can you emulate that? Because this is good news. And that is good news for the whole world. Good news for everybody, the whole world. Is Christianity good? Yeah. Now let's skip down to verse 12. Paul says, okay, okay, now look, you got a part to play with this. He says, men, women, I want you to continue to work out. I want you to continue to allow God to squeeze out everything in you associated with your salvation, with fear and trembling, because then in verse 13, he says, for it is God who works in you. Then look at this. To will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And what's his good purpose? That the whole world will know that there is a God who is inviting the world to call him father. That the whole world will know that he sent his son to pay the ultimate price and invites all of us to follow him and join him in a whole new world order. In an order that or a kingdom, this kingdom is where hearts rule because our hearts are in sync with the heart of God. It's not a power play. It's subversive in how we change the world. That's a good invitation to everybody and it changes everything. Because it changes us from the inside out. And then he wraps up. And he says, look. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Whoa. Let me read this again to New Zealanders. All right? <laughs> a culture of complaint. Find one thing to complain about and you got with someone else and you got a best mate for life. Right? That's okay. Do everything without grumbling. I'm a Kiwi too, by the way. I'm a citizen. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. He's talking to Christians here. So that you may become blameless. Know what blameless means? Blameless means nobody can blame you. Blameless means that, you know what a blameless person does? A blameless person messes up. They're not perfect. They mess up. But when they mess up, you know what they do? Sorry. They immediately apologize. Sorry. Because the moment you do that, nobody can blame you. You've already taken care of it. Man, I'm going to go talk to her because, man, oh, wait. Oh, she's already, she's already owned that? She's already said sorry? Uh, okay. Man, I'm going to go give him a piece of my, my, oh, no. He's already apologized? Oh, okay. See, blameless means I'm not carrying any blame. It means I goof up, I mess up, I don't do some good things, but then I own it. And I own it so quickly that you don't have an opportunity to blame me because I've already said sorry. You can't catch me do it. I, I've already said sorry. I've already confessed it. I found you and I said I messed up. That's blameless. That's pure. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. And then get this. It's kind of a like father, like something. Without fault in a warped what's in it for me kind of crooked generation. See, Paul says that when you do this, and especially when you do it in a church setting, and you do the group of people in a city or a town, he said, what happens is you're gonna shine like stars in the sky. Your selfishness will stand in sharp contrast to the selfishness characterized by the world. So what I've done is I, I, I found a blog that was written by another pastor. <laughs> And he put out four suggestions on how do we practically live this out. I just want to throw this out there for us to think about. How does good news behave? In light of Philippians 2, what are some very practical things we can do? Four suggestions on how to be light in the world. How to shine like stars in the sky in your little part of the world. Number one, apologize immediately. Immediately. We're not, you know, we're not always good news. So when you mess up, I'm sorry. Immediately. Just own it and own it quickly. Because that for right away you become blameless. Not because you're perfect, because there's nothing to blame you for. You owned it. That's one shift. That one shift. There might be someone here today. That one shift might 
change and live you to a whole new level of love and respect and healing and communication. That one shift. Number two, forgive quickly. Quickly. We got to forgive quickly. Why? Because we've already been forgiven by Jesus. Quickly. As Jesus followers, we have no excuse to hang on to bitterness and anger. Yes, we're going to hurt. And yes, we've got to deal with the emotions of that hurt. But in terms of forgiveness, forgive quickly. Next week, heads up, we're going to have communion together. It's the first Sunday of the, of the month. Communion is the time we get together and we remember that we've been forgiven by Christ. We remember that we are to do likewise. So this coming week, if you have areas where you've got to make things right, apologize quickly, forgive quickly, take care of it. Come to the table blameless next Sunday. Number three, great word. We don't use it much. Defer habitually. Defer habitually. You know what defer means? Defer means you go first. Oh, no, 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 you go first. Oh, no, no, you go first. That's defer. It means we don't defer well. We defend well. We defend well. We protect. We proclaim our rights. But to give it up for someone else, that's a new lifestyle. It's an opening the door for someone else to go first with lots of things, with their need, with their purpose, making room for others, doing what you got to do to help other people feel welcomed, pursuing others. And why? Why do we defer? Why should we put other people first? Because it's good news of great joy for all people. A king was born, a king who came and gave his life for his subjects instead of making his subjects give their life for him. And then finally, number four, give sacrificially because God so loved the world he gave. He gave his time. He gave his service. He gave of himself. He gave his life. The good news becomes bad news when I'm bad news. The good news for somebody else becomes bad news when I'm bad news for somebody else. When the news becomes more about what than about who, about who. When the news becomes more about a view than it becomes about you and you and you and you. When the good news is more about an opinion than about another. When that happens, it's not good news anymore. So the question for us, while we sing, as the band comes forward, and as we have a time of worship, take some time as we sing with Jesus, are you good news? Are you good news to all other people? Because if the good news lives inside us, there be, should be something about us that's good news for everybody else. Process that. Think that through as we sing and as we pray. Father God, thank you that because you're good news, we can be good news. That because you love us, we can love others. Because you've forgiven us, we can forgive others. Thank you that because you put other people first, we can put other people first. Through the power of your spirit, help us to be like you to all people. In Jesus' name, amen.